This is Research Like a Pro, episode 211, Pennsylvania Germans, part five, more records. Welcome to Research Like a Pro, a genealogy podcast about taking your research to the next level, hosted by Nicole Dyer and Diana Elder, accredited genealogist professional. Diana and Nicole are the mother-daughter team at familylocket.com and the authors of Research Like a Pro, a genealogist guide. With Robin Worthland, they also co-authored the companion volume, Research Like a Pro with DNA. Join Diana and Nicole as they discuss how to stay organized, make progress in their research, and solve difficult cases. Let's go. Good morning, good afternoon, whenever you're listening to this. Welcome to Research Like a Pro. Hi, Nicole. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you, Mom? I am doing great. All right. Well, we hope you want to join us for our study group this fall. You'll register. And we're looking forward to working together with you on a research project. Today, we're going to be talking with Alice Childs again. Hi, Alice. Hi. How are you today? Great. Thanks for coming. We have gone through so many wonderful records about Pennsylvania Germans, and today we get a fun one where we get to talk about different types of records that could help us beyond land, probate, and church, which we talked about in previous episodes. So today we'll talk about some tax records and different other types of things you might be able to find. Great. So let's start off with tax records, one of our favorite types. So Alice, what kind of tax records are available in Pennsylvania? Well, Pennsylvania tax lists are pretty complete for most counties in Pennsylvania. So accessing them will be a little different depending on what you find online or what you have to find elsewhere. But it's just important to remember that tax records started being kept a long time before the first census was taken in 1790. And they're such a great resource that will help you locate your ancestors in a particular place and time. Again, it will be helping you trace their migration or show that they did live in a certain place. And it's another great resource where you can build the fan club as you look at them. So sometimes tax records have been alphabetized and that's a little less helpful for fan club research. But if they're not alphabetized, the people whose names appear next to your ancestor will be their fan club and could have been family members or other close associates. Like I said, you can trace their residence and migration. You can also, with tax records, estimate their age and marital status, and I will talk about that. You can gain clues about property ownership, and tax records are a great source for estimating when a person died, if they disappeared from the tax record, and they're also helpful to separate same-named men. So as far as estimating the age of a person, in Pennsylvania, the age of taxation was usually 21. And another clue that's great on Pennsylvania tax records is that taxpayers were separated into three different categories. So the first category was landholder, and that meant they owned real estate. And an inmate or a tenant would indicate a married man who didn't own real estate. And then the third category is is free men, and those were single men without real estate. So if you don't know that terminology, you might be a little confused when you look at the tax record, but those are really great clues that help you learn more about your person's age and marital status and different things about them. Thanks for giving us a little bit of a rundown on that. And I think some of those terms are kind of fun, inmate or free men. So it's always interesting to think of those. Inmate, you might think an inmate is someone in an institution or something, right? (laughs) Well, when you were defining the differences between landholder, inmate, and free men, I had to laugh that an inmate is a married man with (laughs) without real estate, (laughs) and a free man is a single man. (laughs) But then again, you know, when I looked it up, the word origin of inmate goes along with tenant. Like you said, it's somebody who without real estate, so like they're living on someone else's land. And the origin of the word inmate comes from two words, in, like going to an inn and like lodging there, right? And mate, so somebody who was like a lodger or a subtenant at a shared house. Wow, that's so interesting. So apparently that was kind of a 16th century term in English, inmate. And so knowing that helps to understand, okay, this is just a person who's probably renting, doesn't own land. That's so good. Well, let's talk now about how to find the tax records and in what repositories and websites can we look in? 
Okay, so if you're wanting to find online records, which a lot of time, always, we want to be able to find them online, right? Um, FamilySearch and Ancestry both have records. FamilySearch has microfilmed and digitized a lot of tax records. And so the process for finding these is the same that we usually use. Just go to the catalog and search by county and then scroll down to taxes to see what's available. Ancestry has a collection that's interesting. It's called Pennsylvania Tax and Exonerations, 1768 to 1801. So this is a time period where our Pennsylvania German ancestors would have, you know, been living there and just getting started in some cases. And these records are really easy to search, but they're incomplete. So you can read the collection dis description and it will tell you whether your county is included. And a word of caution the years assigned to the tax lists by Ancestry are not always accurate. As I've researched these, I've gotten confused about a few things because sometimes it will give a man's name and it will have him listed several times in the same town in the same year. But you go to the list and it's obviously different lists and there are not that many men of the same name in the same town. And so the years assigned are not always accurate. So sometimes you can find the year maybe at the beginning of that section, there will be uh, the year, you know, often they're alphabetized. And so you can go back to the A's and then see if the year is listed at the beginning of that section. And if you can't find the year, I have had success reaching out to the Pennsylvania State Archives. That's where the originals are held. And they are able to tell me what the years are for. If I give them the link to the particular record, they've been able to tell me the year. So just be aware of that when you're looking at that ancestry collection. And if you don't find your ancestor in this database, go ahead and expand your search because it's, like I said, incomplete. Um, another place for tax lists from this period is the published Pennsylvania archives that we talked about in a previous episode. They have tax lists from 1765 to 1791, and that's in the third series, volumes 11 through 22. And there's an index of those in volumes 27 through 29. So remember, I told you sometimes it's hard to know what's in these different volumes and series in the Pennsylvania archives. And you can go to Wikipedia and search Pennsylvania archives, and it will give you a list of that or search by name at fold three. In addition to the tax list that you typically think of and that we've been talking about created by each county, there are other tax lists that have been created in Pennsylvania. So there were quit rents, and that was an early form of taxes that landowners in Pennsylvania owed to the pens. And often settlers would evade these taxes and the records are incomplete, but there are records and you would want to check them out if you have, if they're available for your county and they are in the form of rent rolls. So Family Search has a collection that's titled Rent Rolls 1703 to 1744. So that can pick up some of the earlier ancestors that you might have. And there's another tax that Pennsylvania has a really complete set of records for, and that's the 1798 direct tax. And Ancestry has digitized and indexed those records, and that's in a collection called Pennsylvania U.S. Direct Tax Lists 1798. That's a great resource for that one year. And then another thing that Pennsylvania did, they took a septennial census every seven years from 1779 to 1863. And there's a collection at Ancestry titled Pennsylvania U.S. Septennial Census. And again, that's incomplete, but that was taken for the purpose of taxation. And so it's considered a tax list also. So there are a lot of different resources for tax lists in Pennsylvania. Yeah, that's quite a, a list there. And I'm glad you pointed out the septennial census because it doesn't sound like a tax list, but when you look at it, I'm sure it looks like one and mm -hmm. was used for the purpose of that to figure yeah. out who they're going to tax. Yep. I think it's so interesting that they did this septennial census every seven years. <laughs> it seems kind of random, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we love tax records and they are so very valuable, especially when figuring out ages of people mm -hmm. and people of the same name. So great. So it's wonderful that Pennsylvania has such a great collection. Well, let's jump now to military records. And what can you tell us about military records for our Pennsylvania German ancestors? 
there were a number of conflicts and some that you, you know, that I hadn't really heard of before. There were several that took place during the peak years of German immigration. So some of these that you might think about include King George's War. That was from 1744 to 1748. Lord Dunmore's War in 1774. Pontiac's War in 1763, the French and Indian War from 1756 to 1763, and then, of course, the American Revolution from 1775 to 1783. So some of the best resources for Pennsylvania military records for these early conflicts are in, again, the published Pennsylvania archives. The fifth series has military records from the colonial and revolutionary era, eras, and you'll find muster rolls and abstracts of pension application and enlistment papers in those. And then in the sixth series, you will find military records from the Revolutionary War through the Mexican War. And again, you can find those at Fold 3 and search by name. Also, for the Revolutionary War, you have your compiled military service records and Revolutionary War pensions and bounty land records. And you had Michael Strauss on your podcast. I think it was episodes 82 and 94, and he gave some great in-depth information about those records. So I would invite your listeners to go back if they want to learn more about how to find those records and what would be contained in those um, but you can find these military service records are indexed at Family Search, and images are available at Fold 3. And Revolutionary War pensions and bounty land applications are also indexed at Family Search with images at Fold 3. So there are a lot of great resources and places to look for military records. That's great. We have such a wonderful collection there at Fold 3. And I love it that the published Pennsylvania archives are for free. That is just so fabulous. Yes, that's right. You can access it without a subscription. So it's such a great resource. You can watch for times, you know, sometimes around Memorial Day or different times, they also will offer free access for a week or something. So watch for those those times too. Yeah, when you were talking about Fold 3 having the Pennsylvania Archives database for free, I was remembering that the War of 1812 pension files are also part of the free collection at Fold 3. and. Oh. Awesome. Then I looked it up and they actually have 214 free collections at Fold3. So they, yeah. they've made a lot of things available for free. So that's kind of a, a good thing to know when you're looking at military records that you don't necessarily need to get a subscription because you can just look up a lot of things for free. And then if you find something that you need, you can go to like a family history center and they will often have Fold3 access. Yeah, that is a great point. Okay, well, let's talk now about naturalization records. How can we find those? Okay, well, I'll first talk about how important naturalization was to our Pennsylvania Germans. So in order to get the permanent title to their land, immigrants were required to gain citizenship. If they didn't have citizenship, then when they died, their land would revert back to the pens. And that was a policy that was upheld for a lot of years. So anyone who wasn't naturalized would lose their land when they died and their family wouldn't get it. And so that was a really important reason for Pennsylvania Germans to become naturalized. And also, they got the right to vote when they became naturalized. And that was really important to them, too, because they wanted to make sure that they were not being oppressed, you know, at, like they were back in Germany. So naturalization was really important. So the early immigrants were considered citizens when they gave their oath of allegiance, when they arrived in the U.S. and went to the courthouse and signed the oath of allegiance, that automatically made them become citizens. In 1740, there was the Naturalization Act, or sometimes it's called the Plantation Act, and that formalized the naturalization process. And that kind of began the process of having to be a resident for a certain number of years. It stated that they had to be a resident of the colonies for seven years without being absent greater than two months. And then they could just declare their allegiance to the King of England, profess their Christian faith, and pay two shillings. So the naturalization process was fairly simple as long as they had been a resident for a number of years. Then in 1790, the naturalization process became even more formalized and turned into the process that we're more familiar with, which is where they would file a declaration of intention after they'd been in the country for two years, and then they could file a petition for naturalization three years later. So it kind of evolved over time. So keep those changes in mind as you're seeking naturalization records. 
a few things to remember about naturalization records is that the later in time you get, the more information the records will have that's genealogically significant. Earlier records don't really provide a lot of information beyond the name and perhaps where the immigrant came from and how long they'd been in the country or something, you know, just very minimal information. The other important thing to remember is that before 1906, an immigrant could file for naturalization in any court anywhere. They didn't have to go to their county court or their state court. Or, you know, there was no court that was designated to handle naturalizations. And they could file their declaration in one court and then their final petition in another court. So a good practice is to look for the court records in the court that's closest to where your ancestor was living, because that's probably where they would have gone to file their papers. You can start looking for naturalization records for your Pennsylvania German ancestors in several different places. The earlier records, there's a collection called Names of Foreigners Who Took the Oath of Allegiance to the Province and State of Pennsylvania, 1727 to 1775, and that's available at Ancestry. That will catch those earlier ancestors. And naturalization lists from 1740 to 1773 are available at Family Search and Ancestry. Also available in Series 2, Volume 2 of the published Pennsylvania Archives. So that's one collection available in three different places. And just note that the collection at Family Search is locked, and so you would have to access that in a Family History Center. Another record set is at Ancestry, and it's Pennsylvania U.S. naturalization records from the Supreme and District Courts from 1794 to 1908. And finally, Ancestry has another just general Pennsylvania U.S. federal naturalization records from 1795 to 1931. So that that covers different levels of courts at Ancestry and a couple of different collections. Yeah, looking in all the different court levels can be one of the most challenging parts of looking for these naturalization records, but it looks like there's a lot of good resources to help aid that search. Yeah, there are great resources. Well, going right along with naturalization is court records. Naturalization records are a form of court records, but there are other kinds of records that are in the courts, and it's really great to just have a little bit of knowledge about what kind of things can be in court records and especially how to find them. So with that in mind, what kind of court records are available in Pennsylvania? Okay, so... Court records can be really helpful, and they are available. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court and the Court of Courts of Common Pleas were established by an act called the Judiciary Act of 1772. Before that time, central courts didn't exist, and so you won't find court records very well before 1722. But the court system has evolved over the years, so you need to familiarize yourself with what courts were available in which time period. Um, There's a really good history of the courts of Pennsylvania, and I kind of did a brief overview of that in my blog post. But court records for state-level courts are held at the physical Pennsylvania State Archives, not the published ones that we've been talking about. They're at the Pennsylvania State Archives, and a lot of them have been microfilmed, and they're available at Family Search. So again, go to the catalog and do a place search and scroll down to court records to find those. And records created by other courts are usually held by the court itself. The Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission, which is the online repository for the Pennsylvania State Archives, has a really good description of the offices that you can find in a county courthouse and what their responsibilities are. So when you're looking for certain things about your ancestor, you can go to their website and just look at the different offices to determine what courthouse you might want to contact to find records for your ancestry. Uh, There's one term in Pennsylvania that's kind of unique and you'll want to be aware of, and that's the prothonotary. The prothonotary is a title for the clerk of the Court of Common Pleas, and he was in charge of keeping the civil records. So any civil records would be in the prothonotary's office, and that's a good term that's unique to Pennsylvania that you'll want to keep in mind. Wow, that's really interesting. I've never heard of that word before. I love how Pennsylvania has some unique terms and some new unique records. All such good information to know. Thank you for sharing all that. Now let's talk about German newspapers. We've heard in the past from Heidi when we talked with her that they have a lot of different kinds of German newspapers and sometimes they're even in German. So can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, that's right. Because they retained their German culture and identity, the Pennsylvania Germans did create local newspapers and print them in German. And just to get a feel for the number of German newspapers that were around and available, you can go to Chronicling America and then search the U.S. newspaper directory. Just search for Pennsylvania and German language, and that will just give you a list of the German newspapers and where they were published. And this is a great resource. They don't always have all those papers online and digitized, but it does give you a comprehensive list of newspapers that were available. And then it will also tell you where those papers are held and where you can find copies of them. So I like that resource at Chronicling America, but you will see when you go there that there were a number of newspapers printed in German in Pennsylvania. And obviously they're a valuable source of really genealogically significant information. You can find information about birth, marriage, and deaths through notices and obituaries. There'll be notices of property sales and other events that can lead to additional records. So to aid in your research, you can look for abstracts of newspaper notices as well. There, a man named Edward W. Hawker compiled genealogical data relating to the German settlers of Pennsylvania and adjacent territory from advertisements in newspapers published in Philadelphia and Germantown. So that's a great resource that would give you abstracts of different things that were published over a period from 1743 to 1800. And that's digitized and available at Family Search. So you know, think beyond just the newspapers themselves and look for abstracts that have been compiled to gain information from these newspapers. It's always good to look in that Chronicle in America newspaper directory. I have even ordered some newspapers to my local library on microfilm through interlibrary loan. So it's really a good idea to check and see if there's a newspaper out there somewhere that could be helpful. Yeah, that's a great tip. Well, let's talk about another type of record, and that is family records. And Pennsylvania Germans have some unique family records. So can you tell us about that? Yeah, it is always fun when you can find these. They're sometimes a little more difficult to find, but they're so fun to look at when you do find them. One of the first ones I would think about is Bible records. A lot of families recorded vital information in a family Bible. So the bride would maybe be presented a family Bible by relatives as a wedding gift, and then they would start recording the marriage date and the birth dates of their children and any deaths that occurred in the family. And so those are really great resources, and they might still be in possession of the family. So you can reach out to extended family members to find if you think a family Bible might be out there somewhere, you can start reaching out that way. Sometimes they've been donated to a local historical or genealogical society. And the Family Search Research Wiki has a great list of places to look for family Bibles from Pennsylvania. So that's a good place to go and see where collections of family Bibles are held. A really unique record for the Pennsylvania Germans are Frachter and Taufschein. And so Frachter is a type of folk art, and it's a decorated manuscript. And these played a big role in the culture of Pennsylvania Germans. They were really popular in the period from 1750 to 1840, and you will recognize them. There's central text, and it's usually surrounded by embellishments around the edge. You know, they've drawn different things around the edges. They're really beautiful. Um, The most common type of fracture were birth and baptismal certificates, and those were called Taufschein. And they were very common, so much so that by the middle of the 19th century, they started mass producing designs. You know, they would get them printed and just so people could get them and fill them in. So you might find those in home sources. Again, maybe a relative has had one handed down to them. They also could have been tucked into the family Bible or saved with the family's important documents. Manuscript collections might have these. Published family history books could be a good source. I have a Taufschein for my husband's ancestor. He was born in 1775 in Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania, and it was in possession of the woman who authored a family history book, and she included a color image in the front of her book, Matthias Milestones. So that was really fun to see that in there. Libraries and historical societies also have collections of frock tour. There's uh, just for example, the Free Library of Philadelphia or the Franklin and Marshall College Library, the Burke's History Center, the Library of Congress also has a small collection. So there are a lot of different places that you can look. And there's a website called Frochter Web, and that has a history of the Frochter and Tofschein practice and a bibliography of 
there's over a thousand books on the topic. And so there's a bibliography there. So that's a really fun source that you might be able to discover for one of your ancestors that's unique to Pennsylvania Germans. Well, well I'm just looking at some of these Fraktur and Tauschein images that you have shared links to, and they are absolutely beautiful. What a treasure if you can find one that is in your family. So, wow, thanks so much for opening our eyes to that. I love it. Yeah, the, this one is beautiful. Looks like it's an example for a woman named Joanna Montelius, and it's her birth and baptism certificate. So this is the example that Alice put up on the blog post, but it's really pretty. It's like a heart with writing inside and flowers on the outside on old looking paper. And I'm guessing this was included in some kind of family album or? Yeah, I can't remember exactly. I don't have the blog post open, but I found a couple of different ones and got permission from the <laughs> the people that had posted them online to republish them on the blog. It's fun to find, look and see all the different ones and the creativity of the people who created them. I guess a lot of times it was a schoolmaster that they would hire to create hmm. the certificate for their child. So that makes sense. Yeah. And so there are different schoolmasters, you know, the different collections will talk about the work of this schoolmaster or that schoolmaster or whatever. It's really fun to dig into these. Well, it kind of reminds me of the tradition we have in our family of like cross stitch birth date things for each child, right, mom? Yeah, absolutely. I think every generation has the thing that they do and cross stitch was big for a while and you know, back in my grandmother's day, it was more samplers. I have a sampler she and my mom did. So anyway, it's kind of fun, that home craft. And these do remind me a little bit of the toll painting we did in the 1970s. I remember toll painting. <laughs> this has been a wonderful series. And thanks for doing these posts, Alice. And it's just kind of scratching the surface of what records you might locate for your Pennsylvania German ancestors. There's so many more things available in Pennsylvania, as we've heard, is a wonderful state for genealogical research. So hopefully you can use the information provided in this series to get started. And also be sure to do your own work to find additional records in the county where your ancestors lived. Make a locality guide for that area and see what you can find out. And then stay tuned because Heidi Mathis will be helping us wrap up this series by talking about using DNA evidence to help us research our Pennsylvania German ancestors. So we look forward to that. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me to be on the podcast. All right, everybody have a great week and we'll talk to you again next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. We hope that something you heard today will help you make progress in your research. If you want to learn more, purchase our books, Research Like a Pro and Research Like a Pro with DNA on Amazon.com and other booksellers. You can also register for our online courses or study groups of the same names. Learn more at familylocket.com slash services. To share your progress and ask questions, join our private Facebook group by sending us your book receipt or joining our courses. To get updates in your email inbox each Monday, subscribe to our newsletter at familylocket.com slash newsletter. Please subscribe, rate, and review our podcast. We read each review and are so thankful for them. We hope you'll start now to research like a pro.